We're back. Okay, welcome. Please introduce yourself. My name's Kevin Johnson. And you are, can we call you a local boy? Yeah. I Fannin think. County? Uh, uh, Fannin County, I've been in Gilmer County roughly about 25 years, grew up in Fannin County. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's so weird. I've been up here 48 years. But if you talk to my late mother-in-law, she'd say, yeah, she's from Atlanta. And I'm like, no, I've been up here 48 years. So I'm probably about as basic as you can get. Now, I love the military and I love the background of the military and I love our country and I love this flag. And we actually, we usually have two flags behind us and it's important to me to make sure that America is taken care of by those who have served in the military. And I always ask people, where did you start and why did you become a, a Marine and why did you do this? What really, you, you said earlier on the Facebook thing we were talking on that your dad was military. Did he influence you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, he uh, was Navy to the bone, 22 uh -huh. years. Retired. My daddy had a Navy tattoo here when he was buried. I looked in the casket and said, yeah, it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he gave 22 years of service. Uh, and from all over and we we traveled all over as kids uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and been to different places and, and uh, uh, funny fact I, I, you could call a funny fact my youngest sister was actually born in Guantanamo Bay Cuba on wow. the naval base oh wow so we were all there too as kids uh-huh do you remember Cuba very little but mm -hmm. I do some mm -hmm. uh, my mother has pictures and she st she still pulls those pictures out and we wow. go over them often so that is so cool and the only thing I remember about Cuba is they still show today that they drive around in old antique cars they do really cool antique cars yeah. so okay you started out as a marine you chose the marine rather than the navy yes a little bit of history with that uh, the, the the reason for going in the marines that there's a few but one of the the bigger reasons for me, I wanted to, to test my mettle. I wanted mm -hmm. to see if I could be a part of the, the Marine Corps is known as being the toughest that we have. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to test my mettle and I had a cousin who also uh, was the same age that mm -hmm. wanted to do the same thing. So we went in together. Did y'all kind of <clears throat> compete a little bit? Did you both excel? Did you do things kind of on equal? <clears throat> well, I, he's more like a brother to me. Um, Compete probably not. Uh, we we uh, went in on a buddy system, mm -hmm. so uh, we were we were at a lot of places, one just behind the other. Mm -hmm. And now his his MOS, which is a military objective school, meaning his job, mm -hmm. was different than mine. So mm -hmm. after uh, some of the basic training, which is boot camp and, and infantry training, and then we kind of went our different ways to to uh, specialize in the field that we were there to be in. Mm -hmm. His was Stinger, miss Stinger Missiles, which is a surface-to-air anti-aircraft missile, and mine was aircraft. Uh, my platform was Cobra helicopters, mm -hmm. Cobra gunships. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any female Cobra pilots? No, during my time, uh, there were very few females in the Marine Corps at all, but mm -hmm. I don't remember ever running across any female pilots. It's so interesting to see how the military and everything else in life has changed because we are seeing anybody can pilot an aircraft today. You know, you might have a, a five foot two pilot doing the plane that you're flying across country in today. It's a very different world. It is. Very different world. Now, as your military career, you get out of the military and then you decide to do what? Uh, I wanted to get into law enforcement. So, Why? Uh, Why would you want to put yourself out there and do that? <laughs> uh, I think the drive for service. Mm -hmm. um, the Marine Corps really instilled that in me even more so. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always proud of my dad and his brothers. My dad's oldest brother was a World War II veteran who served during uh, the Battle of the Bulge and was, was badly wounded. He was a bronze star, or a silver star, purple heart, wow. under Patton's Third Army. He had to lay... I loved I love Patton. I love Patton. Yeah. Oh gosh, I love it. He oh. was wounded while they were overran and had to lay in the snow oh, for three wow. days, and that's what kept him alive. It froze him, basically. Oh my goodness. Uh, my uh, my dad's next brother was also in Europe during World War II. Both of them are have been gone for a long time now. Mm -hmm, my dad mm -hmm. was in during the Korean era, and his youngest brother was a Vietnam vet. All mm -hmm. of those men are gone now, mm -hmm. but wow. they played a big role in my life. And Your dad's gone now. Yes, he's been gone about eight years now. Wow. Well. And as your career in, in being a police officer came here and there and everywhere, you started in Cherokee County. How did you end up with the Georgia State Patrol? 
Well, the Georgia State Patrol was my initial go. Uh, back then, becoming a trooper was difficult. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was a hard job to get. And it didn't pay well. No. I've seen the paychecks, still, I know. Still doesn't pay, pay well. well. No, um, it has to be a labor of love. It has to be a labor of love. We had received a raise about four to five years ago. Before that, it was 10 years before we'd had a raise and we mm -hmm. were the lowest paid state police right. in the nation. And you were losing good men Lose. because they would not ante up the money. Lost a lot of good guys. A lot of good guys. And, and you can't blame them because you couldn't support your family on what the GSP was paying. No, generally you'd have to work two and three uh, mm -hmm. off-duty jobs, which I've done throughout my whole career. Yeah, exactly. Now, to get to post commander in Blue Ridge, tell me the steps yeah. that you had to follow to do that. Well, uh, I've served at several posts as a slit, what we refer to as a slick sleeve trooper, the regular patrolman level. And uh, the process to get in that, the state has uh, a, a system set up for promotions. Mm -hmm. And that system is, is you initially you take a written exam. That written exam gets you to the next process. The next process is you go in front of a board of troopers from all over southeast that are not from Georgia, so there's mm -hmm. no bias in Nobody in that knows board. you, yeah. And uh, you're given two scenarios. They give you a stack of papers of a post that's got all these problems. You've got to identify the problems, identify how you're going to correct them, and identify what you're going to do in the future to prevent those problems from reoccurring. Mm -hmm. You do that two different times, and then you do a four-page essay. And then you're rated over all that, and you're put in tiers. There's a tier level one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. To get promoted, you've got to get in tier level one. So uh, for corporal, the first time I assessed, I made tier level two. You mm -hmm. didn't get in there. The second mm -hmm. time I assessed, I made tier level one, got promoted, and was actually promoted at Blue Ridge. So I served there two years, reassessed, uh, made in tier level one, got promoted to sergeant, what we refer to as buck sergeant, mm -hmm. at Jasper. Stayed there in Jasper. They froze the, the uh, hiring system and promotions due to budget cuts. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I remember that time. I yep. was stuck there five years. We mm -hmm. didn't promote anybody for five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then immediately after that, I went through the process again, got in uh, tier level one and got promoted to uh, the post commander of Blue Ridge, had just gotten promoted to lieutenant. So that opened up for me and, mm -hmm. and got to come home. So that was a great thing. And would you rather be, because my daddy was a beat cop in Atlanta walking a beat near the Capitol, <clears throat> off Memorial Drive. You know, that, that doesn't sound like fun. You get to do chases, you get to do all these things when you're in that blue car and you're out on the interstate and you're doing all that. Was your favorite part dealing with the people or was your favorite part being over the post and being over the guys who are out there dealing with the people? I think it's a, a, a love for both. Um, dealing with the people and trying to help people, uh, believe it or not, a lot of people uh, think that our purpose is to actually go out there and purposely arrest and write tickets. That's, mm -hmm. not, that's not our purpose. Mm -hmm. Our purpose is to enforce the law and help the public. So I've always enjoyed that. Um, the uh, supervision part of it, fostering young troopers, mm -hmm. young men, uh, showing, passing on knowledge and helping them through their everyday lives. These mm -hmm. guys are human. They bring their lives to work with them just like everybody else. And one of the things you and I talked about before we went on the air, you actually, I showed you a wreck that happened in Emerson yesterday and a gentleman died <laughs> and then two children were life flighted. You worked a fatality wreck, a horrific accident, drunk driving. I have a dear, dear friend whose only child was killed because of a <clears throat> drunk driver. That to me would be the part of your job you would love and hate at the same time because you love bringing that drunk off the road and you hate having to show up at a door telling somebody they've lost their family because somebody was drunk. It's awful. Um, those things stick in your mind uh, forever. And you take it home with you. Yeah, well, you, absolutely. Yeah. You take it home with you. Uh, sometimes it, they visit you in your dreams. Sometimes mm -hmm. you pass the site on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, that rip at you. Yeah. It's, it's a difficult thing and especially if it's somebody you know and I've yeah. had to do that. Yeah and a young trooper isn't prepared for that you know I we were walking in Captain D's in Jasper I think it was Saturday evening and three troopers were coming out the door one was an older gentleman and then two were young and you could tell they were probably just you know getting in there and I thought y'all have no idea what you're gonna face because I know the life of a trooper. I remember an accident in Roswell and the two troopers who worked this said when they got there, it was a fatality and it was the most horrific thing they'd ever seen. And both of them had issues dealing with that because you don't forget it. You know, you don't forget it. 
it's hard to and, and what we try to encourage those guys to do is is to, to come talk to us mm -hmm. let's get this out because if you hold it in it makes it worse and we've got a sure. program set up too for professionals to help but now troopers are a lot like uh, military they, mm -hmm. there's a lot of pride and they they mm -hmm. tend to refuse that help mm -hmm. uh, it, it's difficult and I've seen death as all of them will in about every form you can imagine right and making that visit to somebody's home and the screams that you mm -hmm. hear. Oh yeah, oh it's, yeah. Uh, it's horrible. Yeah, yeah it is. But you do it because you love it. Now, staying in as a trooper, doing what you did as a post commander, was there any part of that that you would go back? Was there anything you would change? Could you see how you could better the way we treat our troopers? Um, me personally, for me in my career, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the troopers, um, I would accept their pay. They needed a pay. They needed an upgrade on pay. I'll tell you. I w I would like to see uh, our legislators continue to work to help these guys uh, get those pay raises mm -hmm. and get those benefits. The benefits actually has gotten worse. Mm -hmm. uh, when I come on, there was a pretty good retirement. There was a lot of uh, legal benefits and insurance and. These guys now don't even have a retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember, if I remember correctly, <clears throat> uniform, the cost of doing your uniforms came out of your pay. Insurance came out of your pay. You did have a little bit of um, savings and, and whatever they call it. <clears throat> but but there wasn't a whole lot left at the end of the month. No, there's, there's really not. And that's where a lot of us spend a lot of time uh, working off duty. I've worked Falcons games. I've worked uh, security details for dignitaries. I've worked at the Congress Center. Mm -hmm. uh, I work now uh, part-time for Northside Hospital. I'm their law enforcement coordinator and I do threat assessments. Uh, I've worked for Wellstar Hospital mm -hmm. doing those same things. So mm -hmm. uh, you're gone constantly. It's right. hard on a marriage. Yeah, but you have to do what you have to do to pay your bills and to support your family. And then you don't want to give up a career that you absolutely love. It's a love. Uh, yeah. It's a love of service. There's no money in it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that love of service brings some, some difficult times for your family. Sure it does. Now, the fun part of doing what you did, you got to do two inaugurations. One was really awesome with President Bush. One was not quite a picnic. And we're not going to talk about the one that wasn't a picnic. We'll talk about the one with Bush. Tell me a little bit about being a part of that detail. It was an honor to get picked. Uh, the state sent 25 troopers. They were handpicked by the colonel. And does every state do that? How does that work? Not every state. The federal government picks the states that they want okay. to do that. And how that process is done, I don't know. Most mm -hmm. of them, believe it or not, are from the southeast. Not all, but most. It's because we know you're going to get up there and be nice to folks. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what southerners do. <laughs> so uh, we, were, we were chosen and we were flown down there. And uh, the Bush, uh, his administration was very kind to us. We were given tours of D.C. Uh, we were sworn Had in. you ever been to D.C. before this? Had never this? been there. Wow. Were you in awe of all the things you got to see? Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, I enjoyed yeah. it. Uh, we were uh, all also sworn in as U.S. Marshals, mm -hmm. so we had arrest powers. So I've been a U.S. Marshal twice for four days <laughs> each time. So. Um, but we stood on line, uh, the, the parade route from the White House to the Capitol, mm -hmm. and uh, basically just to make sure... In your GSP uniforms? Yes. Okay. And we stood on line by, uh, there's a lot of states, Texas, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, New Hampshire, all kinds of... All kinds of uh, uh, I don't think we had anybody from California. Um, Tennessee troopers were there. Mm -hmm. So we also got to converse with other states, which is always that, that there's a... There's a deep brotherhood mm -hmm. in state troopers. So that was that was real interesting mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. And if there had been an active shooter at a inaugural scene, were mm. you prepared to deal with that? Yes, ma'am. We're just like we're trained uh, every day. We're gonna we would actively seek out that active shooter and mm -hmm. aggressively neutralize that shooter if mm -hmm, need be. Mm -hmm. Well, when we look back on the day in history that none of us ever forgot, the assassination of John Kennedy. You know, there were troopers walking alongside, there, was, there were um, Secret Service guys walking alongside that car. Any of them would have laid down their life for the President of the United States. And that's what y'all are prepared to do. We gave an oath to do that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you have to understand that going into it. Right. You have to wrap your mind around there may be a time that you might have to give your life for mm -hmm. somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's crazy, you know, it's crazy, but what an honor, what a neat honor. Now, do you have any keepsakes from that day, that event? I do. Uh, we were given a set of badges, commemorative badges. It's got U.S. Marshal information on it. 
uh, as displays. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I bought my kids a few things from DC. I bet you did. <laughs> uh, they were they were younger then. They're grown now, uh -huh. uh, and they still have those keepsakes. So yeah, it yeah. was a, it was a great time. Yeah, that is so cool. Now, when you look back at your career, are you old enough to retire now? I retired in December. Okay. So why are you ready to go back to work again <laughs> at a new job? What, why are you interested in doing this? Well, I've had some fellow troopers ask me the same thing after, uh, after a career with How the How many state miles patrol. do you think you've driven the, the roads of Georgia as a trooper? Do oh, you have a... I've been all over the state. Uh, mm. We have driven in a day from, from Blue Ridge to Savannah, stood on line, for uh, civil disturbance and then drove right back. Mm -hmm, uh, I've mm -hmm. been at the G8 Summit. I've been in Atlanta many times during uh, uh, civil unrest and places throughout the state so for natural disasters. So why don't disasters. you just want to retire? <laughs> well, uh, a lot of my friends <laughs> asked me the same thing. And I, for a month or two, it was okay, but I still have a will yeah. to want to serve. I yeah. still have a drive yeah. to want to be a part of it. And the judicial system has always been a love for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I had to go recently to a, a hearing in Pickens County, a probate <coughs> judge hearing. And I looked up and I knew the kid, the kid who was our judge. And I watched him grow up and I thought, oh, I didn't know he was our probate judge, you know. And it was interesting to me because I didn't really realize that um, a probate magistrate, it's, it's a whole new ball game. And it is a civil part of our government. Is that what you'll be looking to do? The magistrate's office, you're dealing with criminal, uh, and the criminal part of it is a arrest warrants and search warrants. Mm -hmm. and Which a, you have some experience? Yes. Uh, I did a lot of work with uh, dr uh, drug interdiction teams. I was, when the Zell Miller Drug Task Force was formed here, Roger Queen, who was the district attorney, made I me. I loved Roger Queen. Me too. He made Roger me the first Queen. board member. Loved him. Um, so uh, we did a lot of search warrants, arrest warrants, and, and not just drafting them, but executing them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the civil side of the magistrate court, I've been involved with a lot of civil cases. Uh, generally, those are wrecks where people mm -hmm. are, uh, lawsuits are involved. So right. uh, I know the process with the civil system and the civil courts and uh, have testified many times in those too. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I told you this, and it really still blows my mind. My daddy had a law degree, but he never practiced law in his life. He had several degrees that he never used because he just didn't find that career he wanted to do. But you, in order to be this magistrate judge, you don't have to have a law degree. And when we, we're going to take a commercial break now. When we come back, let's talk a little bit about that and what did prepare you for this job. So we're going to take a commercial break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Whether you're swimming in the sea or splashing in the pool, making a masterpiece or just making memories, writing a great American novel or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow, whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge. Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. When traveling internationally, know where you're going and what the environment is. Also, don't dress to stick out. Dress to blend in with the environment and the culture. Make sure that you put minimal information on your luggage tags. Airlines actually track your bags, which you can follow through your app anywhere domestically and internationally. 
also have a medical plan. We have mobilized rescue systems. These systems are the only integrated medical technology that can integrate to your phone and be used abroad and domestically for any medical emergency that you have. If you have any questions or concerns about travel security or training, please contact Titan International. High speed Wi-Fi. Not quite as important as running water in your home, but close. Ignite Internet from ETC powers your Wi-Fi network with consistent speeds to keep all your gadgets going strong. Streaming video players, laptops, tablets, even smartphones, so you're never stuck with those big cell data charges. And talk about value. Just pick your speed and keep the Wi-Fi flowing in your home at a great low price. Upgrade your Internet today. Call or visit etcnow.com to learn more. I've never been so happy Dancing, swinging, laughing at me Smile on my face It's happiness for days Uh-oh You are everything I need Happy ever after will be Couldn't even dream a better Couldn't even dream a better way Whether it's memories of your first trip to the local Dairy Queen or your daily visit for a $5 lunch special, the Jasper Dairy Queen has been a part of the community for over 40 years. Locally owned and operated, Jasper DQ is the place where specialty items often become favorites. Burgers, shakes, chicken tenders with yummy dip and gravy, and don't forget the rings and fries. Celebration cakes are always fresh and fast and include the awesome blizzard cake. Stop by where folks are always meeting and eating. 515 at Highway 53. Just follow the crowd to the Dairy Queen. We're back. Okay. All right. I whine and complain and gripe about people who don't do their job. I think that if you're elected, the first time we elect you because we believe your platform and we think you have a great idea and a great concept, the next time you better be doing your job and you better be doing it well. If you, you know, number one, people could retire. You don't want to retire. You want to continue in public service. When you walk into a job, as a magistrate judge, as a probate judge, as whatever. What, what are your goals and, and what are you looking at? Well, the number one goal is to uphold people's constitutional rights and protect those rights. And in America, we're sadly we're giving them. them up. Yeah, willingly giving them up at stupidity. And so. judges' positions are very important. That's a very important role when it comes to constitutional rights and the protection of those rights. Mm -hmm. And if somebody walks in and you're talking civil or criminal, how, how detailed? And are there limits that the magistrate judge handles? Is it $15,000? It is, uh, in the civil end it's $15,000 or, or less. And the majority of those cases it will come in, in that civil court will be contractual, the mm -hmm, majority. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about the criminal? What's the aspect of that? The criminal of that uh, is arrest warrants and that is you, the majority of that is law enforcement. However, civilians can come in there and they can take arrest warrants too, but for a civilian person, they have to have a probable cause hearing so that the judge looks at what has went on basically from a report from the, from the sheriff's office mm -hmm. and gets statements from both sides and then that magistrate judge determines if there's enough probable cause for that warrant. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people will say, well, what's probable cause? Probable cause is a detailed articulation of statutory law. Mm -hmm. Statutory law is built by the elements within that law. Mm -hmm. So all those elements must be present, articulated with probable cause for it to be a valid arrest warrant. Because you can't just say, well, my neighbor's dog did so-and-so in my yard and I want him locked up. You can't do that. Right, correct. Yeah. A lot of common sense comes into this. Common sense and, of course, uh, being experienced in with that. Uh, mm -hmm being experienced with the law, what the law, the elements of the law, what it's made of. Uh, search warrants is very similar. Search warrants uh, deals with your Fourth Amendment rights, protection against search and seizures. And as we've recently seen a couple in St. Louis. Oh my gosh. Who had their guns. Oh my gosh, I want to go out there and, and help those people. Yeah. It's crazy. They had their weapons, their guns taken away, and that had to have been issued by a magistrate judge. Mm -hmm. uh, issuing a warrant that is unconstitutional 
creates many problems. Oh yeah. Not only have you violated somebody's civil rights, you've put that municipi municipality, county, whatever, at risk for being sued. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that hurts the taxpayers. But what's important in a, a search warrant is what would cause the curtilage or the area to be searched and of course probable cause and detailed articulation. Mm -hmm. And one thing that is very, very important in no-knock search warrants is something very simple, and that's the address. Mm -hmm. In a no-knock search warrant, and we've seen this throughout the oh, news, I've seen it happen. where law enforcement has showed up at the wrong place wrong door. and a gunfight occurs. Right. Kill somebody. So uh, if, I, if I'm elected, that's one thing that, the way that I'll handle those is that to check and make sure that address is correct. And mm -hmm. they're going to also have to provide me with a Google layout map of where they're going and when they're going. Mm -hmm. No-knock search warrants are very dangerous, and law mm -hmm. enforcement uses that for a various reasons. Some is could be a, a convicted felon that's a danger to them. It could right. be that evidence is at risk of being destroyed. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, simply just trying to uh, execute that warrant in a safe manner against somebody who is dangerous. So right. there's, there's different variations of that. And, and you know, for a person to be involved, if, if a neighbor sees X amount of cars going to another neighbor's house at weird times of day and night, then you might think that person is a drug dealer and you might report it to so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and, and then you get gossip started and there's nothing that's the truth until you really investigate. So just because people are coming and going, there have been people who were tried to be arrested for drug dealers and they weren't, and then there were drug dealers that were right under somebody's nose that were smarter. How do you choose what's the real deal? Well, generally when, when people start that information process, then it's investigated by law enforcement. And law enforcement builds a platform for probable cause. Mm -hmm. That platform might be through a confidential informant, and it might be through surveillance, and it might be through statements or a combination thereof. Mm -hmm. And when those are compiled, they have enough they feel they have enough information for a search warrant, then that's brought before the magistrate judge. He reviews that probable cause to see if, in fact, they do or they do not have enough probable cause. And there's been situations where I've seen a magistrate judge say, you're close, but you're not quite there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go back and keep and keep doing your surveillance and keep... You don't want to blow the deal. Right. Yeah, you don't want to blow the deal. You don't want to blow the deal, but you also want to make sure that you're within your constitutional mm -hmm. boundaries mm -hmm. of the individuals and law enforcement that are... It, it's being a judge is like being a referee in a football game. Mm -hmm. You've got to be fair to both sides. Right. And if you weigh heavy to the left or the right, there can be some problems with that. For the law enforcement side, that problem would be that they that you've got a soft foundation for a case that you'll probably lose. Mm -hmm. For the civilian side, this is really the, the the worrisome part is that you violated somebody's constitutional rights because mm -hmm. you failed to make sure that enough probable cause existed for that search warrant to be executed. Right, right. Now, in your career, you've seen probably any and everything. Um, have you seen cases that you went to trial and you were like, man, we had it, we had everything? and a jury trial and the jury didn't go the way it should have gone? Yes, uh, in this line of work, you, you win some, you lose some, mm -hmm. and, and jury trials are difficult. Um, most defense it's attorneys- It's emotional, isn't it? Oh, it is it's very emotional, very, emotional. And it's very draining, and mm -hmm. it depends on, of course, the charge and the trial itself. And defense attorneys, their job is, is to add as much uh, unclarity to mm -hmm. it as possible, mm -hmm. which puts doubt in the mind of juror, jurors' members. And, the prosecuting side and the law enforcement side is to prevent as solid as a case as they can to give the jurors the information they need to make a good decision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, on the prosecuting side, they're looking for uh, that conviction and on the defense side, they're looking for trying to help their client in their aspect, which is part of our constitutional rights in the law, mm -hmm. so it's a good thing. And you know, as sad as it is, even somebody who's guilty has the right to defense. You know, they have the right to defense even though the attorney going in knows that they're guilty. Now, in a magistrate setting, one person, you, the one person, would make the decision based on the knowledge, the common sense, and do you have a gut feeling about things? Well, I think we all have gut feelings, but uh, the law is pretty strict in the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And in magistrate judges, I don't So hear... you might have to rule something you didn't like because this is the law. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and you're, you're heavily uh, guided within what you can do with the law. And a magistrate judge doesn't hear criminal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, the cases that they would hear would be civil cases 
and and uh, they do bond uh, hearings and bond conditions, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Now the probate judge, he tends to hear more of the misdemeanor criminal uh, criminal cr cases. Mm -hmm. A magistrate judge can and often will hear cases related to county ordinances, though, mm -hmm. and those are smaller misdemeanor mm -hmm. violations. Mm -hmm. But whether you're how you <coughs> feel. You, you want to be compassionate to folks and you want to help folks as much as you can and there is some maneuvering room for that. There is some maneuvering room for good sound judgment uh, but there's also those out of bounds markers mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. says alright judge this is as far as you can go right. no matter what you think the law and the court systems and the chief superior court judge who runs this circuit says this is as far as you can go. Right, right and as that magistrate judge who, who do you work under? Who, who, who do you answer to besides the people who are going to vote for you? The, chi uh, the chief superior court circuit judge who here is Brenda Weaver. Mm -hmm. And at any point in time, do you know of a time that a, a superior court judge said, no, that was the wrong call. What were you thinking? Well, not necessarily, but um, if you go to the magistrate judge's office, whether it be civil or criminal, and uh, you want to appeal that, you can, and that's mm -hmm. a good thing of the judicial process. It's appealed and it's appealed to the Superior Court Circuit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's usually how that is voiced, is if an individual felt like that they, they uh, were ruled on incorrectly, they can mm -hmm. appeal that mm -hmm. to the, uh, the the Superior Court Circuit. Mm -hmm. And what, is it two year, four year term? What's the term? It's a four year term. Four year term, okay. Um, four years into this, you look back at your career, you've had a long <coughs> career, four years, do you believe that you would want to run again and again and again, or how do you feel about people who get in a position and stay there forever? I think that should be up to the public. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. the public wants me to, I will. Depending I, I, on how you do your job. It is, and I, I do believe in limited terms. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, it's good for an individual to stay in there for a long period of time. And mm -hmm. as we've seen throughout our public officials, a lot of them gain power and they lose sight of what they exactly. were put there before. So. Uh, if if the public sees fit to put me in there, it will be at their whim. Mm -hmm. uh, if they decide that if I'm in there that they want me another four terms, then I will. Mm -hmm. And then we'll make a decision from there. But my goal is not to be there forever. Uh, my goal is not to, mm -hmm. is to allow Gilmer County to have that option uh, that they can make those choices and I think we constantly need a refreshment of mm -hmm. folks in office. Mm -hmm. I, I was sitting this weekend thinking about the people that I have known for, um, they used to be ordinaries. You know, when I first came to Jasper, the ordinary was he issued marriage licenses and, and did all kinds of things like that. And that was Beeler Hammontree. He had been in there for a hundred years. And then there was um, another one that came in, was there a long time. And then Rodney Gibson was there a long, long time, 30 some odd years. And, and when you look at that career, you know, I think 12 years and, and let's refresh a little bit. Let's not, let's not stick there. But now that you've done everything you've done in your life, you have all this experience. You're going to bring this experience to the table as a judge. Tell me exactly what you think you can bring that makes a difference in you being in that position. Well, the, the experience in the application of law. Mm -hmm. um, applying the law is Because not, it's not just your opinion. Right. It's the guidelines of the law and what the law says. And applying the law can be a very tough thing. If you've got two individuals in front of you, somebody's going to walk away upset. Mm -hmm. So applying the law is a difficult thing, uh, but it's an important thing. And, and I'm a constitutionalist, constitutionalist in every sense of the word. So applying that law and upholding those constitutions, upholding those laws and individual rights is, is important and that comes through experience. Uh, an example in law enforcement, um, you start from a neutral position on a traffic stop, let's mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. You start and you see a violation, well, that's called probable cause, and you make that stop. Then you've got to investigate a little further, and then you've got to make a decision. Do I write a warning? Do I write mm -hmm. a ticket? Mm -hmm. Is there enough probable cause to make an arrest? Is there something beyond this initial stop that I need to know about? All those decisions that has to come from neutral, or did I stop this person and everything's fine and we, we cut them loose and send them on their way. So a judge is the same way. He starts mm -hmm. from neutral based on evidence presented to him or her. He's got to make those decisions from that point to the end point of where we are when the, when the, the, the hearing's over with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, as a career law enforcement, you, you've been out there, you've seen it all, you've done it all. Working in a small county, you're gonna know a lot of the people who might come before you. How do you deal with that? 
Well, that's a tough thing, and, and I've had to deal with that throughout my career. Uh, again, compassion. Yeah, if you stopped me, I'd look up and say, I fed you a free meal. No. <laughs> <laughs> Com <laughs> compassion's important, mm -hmm. and we want to instill compassion, but we also, it's very important, very important that we uphold the law and the constitutional mm -hmm. rights, mm -hmm. no matter who's in front of you. Yeah, yeah, and that is a tough one. That is a very, very tough one. I've had the very same thing happen to me on the road. My wife and I was in Jasper, uh, we'd been eating, She, uh, we finished lunch, she pulls out in front of somebody, she fails to yield. Oh no. Normally we don't work a wreck on family members because of a conflict of interest, but I was the only trooper. Oh in, no. In poor <laughs> County, so I had to work a wreck on my wife. Oh no. And, and I had to cite her for failing to yield. Oh my. And she was a little upset and it was hard oh, to explain. Yeah. And I said, here's the thing. Um, as you're seeing your insurance go up a little bit yeah. because she's going to be charged. I, today, and I told her today, right now, I'm not your husband. I'm a Georgia State Trooper, and I'm representing the law. And if I don't represent the law fairly, the other wow. end, the, the victim in this mm -hmm. would have been uh, unjustly, it would have been handled wrong. Right. And and policy calls for us to, to handle the law exactly the way it is. So That's a case I would want to be involved it in. It was awful. It was an yeah. awful situation. Yeah. yeah. And I love my wife very much. Uh, but... You know, to be fair, to be that person, you're paying me, you're expecting me mm -hmm. to uphold to the law, right. no matter who's in front of me. Mm -hmm. And it's the same as a judge. If, it, if uh, those people come in front of me, no matter who they are, I have to, I have to be fair. I took mm -hmm. an oath to be mm -hmm. fair. Mm -hmm. I have to uphold those constitutional rights and that. I have to uphold the law. Wow. I don't know why I don't know why anybody who already had all these careers is so excited about doing this again, but I see that your heart's in this. Now, how's this gonna affect your family? Tell me a little bit about your family. Um, my wife is behind me. Uh, my children are behind me. They're grown now and on their own. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the the political end of it has been kind of tough. Politics is, it, for a judge, it's so different. Uh, when you're running for office, you of course have to be involved in the political end of it to get elected. Mm -hmm. Once you're elected, those judges' canons tighten up on you, which are laws that rates the judges, mm -hmm. and you have to become bipartisan. You have to be be fair and, and equal. Mm -hmm. So you tend to kind of step out of the, pol the the political side of it to represent, you know, that robe. Mm -hmm. That rope represents a cloaking of the law. Mm -hmm. It represents mm -hmm. fair and neutrality. So you have to step away from that. But the family, um, my, my wife, she said, uh, whatever you want to do, I'm behind you. But she said, after all this time, I don't know why you want to do I this. I know, so I know. It's, uh, it's just, it's a love. But if you love what you're doing, yeah. yeah it's a love. And you love the public service. I do. Know, that's, that's it, that's it. Now, your children, um, when they look at you, did they follow in your career, anybody in law enforcement? I tried actually to steer my kids away from that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, my son, uh, he is 25 now, I have to think a little bit, mm -hmm. and my daughter's 27. I never let them in that patrol car. Mm -hmm. I never let them play with blue lights. And my son and my daughter both was active in sports and dance and piano, and I missed a ton of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my son, one time when he was little, was was talking to me and he was very upset and he said, Daddy, why can't you coach like the other daddies? Mm -hmm. And I said, because our job is different. Mm -hmm. We're there, we're on the road at night. Mm -hmm. We're on the road at the weekends. Right. So you can be there to play ball. So these other kids can safely be there to play ball. So right. that point in his life, he decided that he didn't want to go through that. Well, he mm -hmm. works now for TVA. Mm -hmm. Uh, at, at nuclear power plants. Oh man, and he's got a great job. He does. He's he, got a great job. In Chattanooga and he yes, loves it. He yes. lives here but he, he commutes back and mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. My daughter lives in Marietta now. She graduated from Kennesaw State. She's mm -hmm. in marketing and works mm -hmm. for Cobb Galleria. Mm -hmm. So uh, I couldn't ask for any any two better kids. I have two stepsons. One who just recently joined the Air Force. Mm -hmm. He's in South Carolina. Oh, right I was going to say, did he go to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas? He did. Yeah, yeah. He works on C-17, so wow. uh, he's doing great. And the other one is 16, he's still in high school. Good young man, gets good mm -hmm. grades. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm blessed all the way around. Lucky and blessed life, and now you wanna to continue to give back. You know, looking at where we've been and where we're going in America, we have a time in America that things aren't normal. Things aren't feeling good. There's not a, um, people aren't working together, and that's really, really hard. And I think it has to start at the bottom and go up. And, and it has to be, we have to teach these kids at home 
to respect our law enforcement. And, and I think when I look around, I know troopers who lost their life on the road. I know troopers who um, retired and had to work another job because your retirement doesn't pay enough for you to really live on. I know troopers who really gave it all and still want to give. And I think that's so very important because that is a life that goes on forever and it's public service. It is. It becomes who you are. You, mm -hmm. That never leaves you. And uh, it is a, it, uh, a lot of the guys that make it to retire, the average lifespan of somebody in law enforcement is 55 years old. Mm -hmm. And it's usually of a heart attack because of the mm -hmm. stress mm -hmm. that they've built throughout their life. So it's I was going to ask you, do you know Frank Wright? I sure do. Do you know Frank, uh, Frank Cathy? Do you remember Frank Cathy? I do. Frank Cathy stopped me one night on Dunbean Hill in the 66 <laughs> Chevelle, and I might have been speeding. I might have been really speeding. But he ended up married to one of the guys that was with him when he stopped me, so it was okay. okay. So it was okay. But I remember those, um, those nights of late nights and horrific stories about accidents, and I remember and it does affect you um, forever. You know, you think about the family and you wonder what happened to those kids because their dad was killed in an accident. And a lot of troopers have had to deal with a lot of stuff, but they do it because their heart's there. They do it because their heart's there. I was with the state's honor guard for several years and I've carried many, this is hard. Mm -hmm. um, I've carried many to their grave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember, and I'm trying to think, was his name Robbie that was killed over in Calhoun? And they were they did the um, procession. I drove over there and, and was at the interstate as all the cars went by with the flags. And he was like 28 years old and he was killed. And, and I remember how the police officers who went back to work the next day had to deal with the loss of their friend's life. He was just doing his job. He was just at work. He was just doing his job. It's, it's difficult and you know, uh, folding those flags over those coffins, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. handing them to their wives mm -hmm. and their kids. Uh, I wished a lot of people could see that. Oh yeah. I wished a lot of people could see the sacrifices that these guys, you know, Christmas day, these guys mm -hmm. are out here on the road. Sure. Yeah. Christmas night, we've worked fatalities. I have on Christmas day. Oh yeah. That, that eats you, uh, but it's, really who you are and your love of, of your of your country and your community. Mm -hmm. Why would somebody do that? That's a very good question. Where do we find these people? It's uh, hard. It is and I can't tell you other than we have a calling mm -hmm. and most of us believe firmly of God's calling to serve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, anytime I see anybody running for political office, I'm like, oh no, they're going to dig up everything about you. Oh no. And then you find out these are just good, genuine people who want to put themselves out there and see if they get the job. And and when you get in there, then you do a great job or you don't get in there, then you, you handle it and you move on with life. But it is, it is truly one of those things when you look at, you put yourself out there and now tomorrow's the day. If you lose the election tomorrow, you go on with life and you're, you're, you know, we're in communities that everybody knows everybody. So you're just nice to folks no matter how it turns out. I told you, I think that my husband lost by nine votes one time and he was so cool about it and he was just, everything worked out fine and he handled it correctly. And I said, that's the way you do life. You know, life is what it is. And um, I want to wish you the best because you never know, you know, you never know how the election's going to go, but Good luck tomorrow. I think it's important that God's will be done and mm -hmm. His will will be done. And if it's His will that I win and I'll go to work for the people as hard as I can. And if That's it's right. not, then He has another direction for That's me exactly to go That's exactly right. In. And I'm, I'm, I'm smiling either way. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you for being here today. Thank you thank for Thank you for me. being a part of our ETC family because we do cover from Ball Ground to Turtletown and it's 12 o'clock and it's time for us to get out of here. Bye, y'all.